point, Christian, and share with us a few of the uh, ideas and uh, experiences and reasons why uh, they did what they did. All right, with a round of applause, uh, welcome. Hello, hello. Uh, this is for recording. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Justin, and uh, I'm very glad to be here to share. It's more, more of a share of knowledge of what we have been done with our customer engage. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. It's much better. Okay. Okay, okay, yeah. So, it, it, so the employee attrition prediction is actually what we have been doing with our customer. And today I'm going to talk about how we approach the data science problem and how we uh, use the programming language R to solve the problem. Okay, so, um, so this is the outline of the, the presentation. Is okay. Can I fix? <laughs> All right. So basically, I will firstly give you a very brief introduction, and then how to, uh, you know, uh, predict the employee attrition in a scientific way. In a, I mean, data data science way to solve the problem, and then the walkthrough of an we call it R accelerator. It's actually an R. Uh, solution template and everybody can use it and customize it to solve their own problem. Okay, so actually we, we, we are with the Microsoft Algorithms and Data Science team and we are located all across the world, you know, from uh, headquarters of uh, Seattle to London and we are in Singapore and also we have team members in Melbourne. And uh, the, the Asian Pacific team here, we, we primarily do a lot of customer engagements to provide a data, data science solution to our customers to solve the real world data science problems. And also we, de uh, we are developing the scalable tools and algorithms that can be used for high performance analytics. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you uh, know data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. What are the differences of these terms? I'm not sure how many of you have idea of this kind of thing, or you just don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, can you can you can you raise your hands if you know data science or? Oh, okay, great. Seems okay. Don't worry, uh, there are some people who are like, <laughs> scientists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, great. Also. Okay, okay, that's <laughs> great, and. Uh, yeah, so data science, to, uh, in my own understanding, I mean, is something like you analyze the data and you, starting with the business problem, and you use the techniques of machine learning algorithms and to, to solve the data science problem, right? So let me give you a very simple, uh, a, a review on a very simple data, that is the iris data. I believe most of you guys have heard about it. It's very simple, it's just like, you have a species of iris, and uh, based on the two features, you can classify iris into uh, three groups, three different species, right? So one of the problem is how can we, you know, by analyzing this data and we can develop a model to predict or to, to classify some new data with unknown labels and uh, pull them into different groups according to their features. So what we usually do with this kind of problem is that we use a machine learning algorithm, and that is, for example, here I show I, I, we can use decision tree, right? And the decision tree will, you know, uh, take the input data, I mean the new input data, and try to classify the data into uh, maybe one of the species of the iris. But my question is, is, is that all? I mean, is it just uh, data science is just as simple as, as this? Actually, the answer is no. In the, in the real world data science project, actually we have a very complicated process of dealing with a, a, a customer project. And we, uh, I'm not sure whether, I believe some of the data scientists, they have heard about the, the cross industry uh, standard process for data mining, right? And the Microsoft has also his own uh, standard for data science process that is called the team data science process, and the advance uh, the, the the advantage of team data science is that it is collaborative, which means that it, it is for a team of data scientists, and also it's iterative, which means 
every time you start from, uh, let's say, a business problem, and then you go to your data acquisition and understanding, and then after some exploration and the pre-processing of the data, you go to your model creation. But when you, let's say, when you create a model, you found that, okay, some of the features are not so useful, right? Maybe you have to go back to the business understanding part, and you have to talk more with your domain experts, and then maybe do some other feature engineers. What I mean here is that this is not the unidirectional. It's, it's like you have a lot of back and forth and you have to you know, iterate multiple times in order to have an optimal model. And after you've got the optimal model, you can deploy the model and you know, everyone else in your department or other guys, they can you know, uh, deploy the model easily with maybe an API or whatever. So this is the a uh, very typical workflow of a data science project. And today, uh, I'm, go I'm going to share a real-world use case scenario that is to predict um, which employees of the company will leave soon by analyzing uh, some, some data of the, about the, the employee. So let's say here we, we have um, one guy. Maybe we know his name, we know his age, and we know how many years he has been working in this company. And plus, we also know some of, because today we know that um, employees, they will also post some, you know, their own opinions or some, maybe some random chat on their social media. And this kind of information is also very useful to analyze whether this guy will leave the company soon, right? And the benefits of doing employee attrition is that because Actually, uh, the, the, the cost of employee loss is very huge, especially for, uh, for big companies. Actually, not only big companies, also small ones, they, they have to carry this kind of problem. And uh, so that is why they, they, they need to find, find a solution by using machine learning and data science technology to solve the problem. Just a quick question. Did sure. you manage to uh, quantify the dollar loss because of attrition for every single employee? Uh, sorry. I. I didn't catch it. Oh, no, because you mentioned that uh, it has a huge impact. There's a lot of losses. Yes. Uh, do you guys mentioned quantify the dollar impact? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is, uh, yes, we have to do that. Because basically, the machine learning or data science can just give you uh, accuracy of the model, right? And uh, we, that is why I said it's very important to talk with the domain experts and also talk with the executives or manager level uh, people in the company so that they can give you a, a something like a success criteria to tell you that, okay, based on the accuracy of the model, I know how much I can save for employee attrition, yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, did I answer your question? No, I'm just wondering to know what's the range that you guys discover, like $100,000 Lost but th this, will, this will depend. I mean, this is not decided by the data scientists, but decided by the, 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 the customers or the company. Oh, so you guys can yeah. actually link that to the dollar that needs to hire the guy, needs to train the guy, because that could be a correlation in that uh, sense. Well. Yes, there will be, but we don't have to do that. We just provide a model, and uh, the model with certain accuracy, uh, okay. and the customer, they can handle so that. The, by themselves. The outcome yep. is how do you reduce attrition? But you didn't look at what is the dollar impact of attrition. That's the client. That. Yeah. Confidential. Yes, that is confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, before we do any machine learning problem uh, project, actually, the first thing is uh, the the uh, to understand well of the business problem, and second thing is we have to know what kind of data we have. If we don't have the data with high quality, actually a lot of time people will say that, okay, what we are doing is just garbage in and garbage out. It's, it's nonsense, right? So we have to firstly analyze, if we want to predict the attrition of an employee, what kind of factors, what kind of data we need to collect. So here I have a list of the, the first column is normally what may be the reasons for a leave of employee, right? So. You know, maybe sometimes this guy just want to have a, have a personal career change because he has been in this company for so many years, but he has not got any promotion. So we can probably use one of the features from this factor, such as the years 
before uh, years taken for a promotion, right? So this is just one example, but here I. I, I cannot say this is the exhaustive list of all of the reasons, but it's just for uh, illustration. And we can actually put the data into two groups. The first one is the static data, which means that the data actually um, uh, don't change or just change in a deterministic way. For example, the age. Every year it will change, but just increments, right? And name. Name will, will not, never change. Or maybe gender, right? It, it doesn't change at all. And another group is, to, uh, is about the dynamic data, which means that the data will change randomly. For example, the performance. Every year, the performance may be different, and they are, they are, correlated, they are correlated in some way, but who knows? I mean, it, it can be regarded as the, the group of dynamic data. So another thing is, after we identify the data we are interested in, we have to go to certain departments of the company to collect the data, right? So HR department may be one of the guys who can provide the data. And also IT department, they have some data that may be useful. And also your director reports, like your manager, he knows you very well, and he, he something like the performance reviews, and sometimes you can use this kind of data as well. And also the social media network, you can you know, collect the public posts of the employees and analyze the, the posts in order to predict the, the attrition. And what's next? After we have got the data, what to do? A lot of times people just, okay, let's just go straight forward to model building. But actually that is not a very good practice. Um, normally we'll do some simple statistical analysis and also visualization on the data is very important. For example, uh, here I just provide a sample data. And uh, the first chart shows that um, what is the percentage of uh, employees who, has, who have last, left the company and who, who have not left the company. And uh, I group the data into uh, by drop level. And the second one is the correlation between drop level and uh, monthly income. Okay, I mean, before that, we, we just intuitively think, okay, maybe these two factors, they are correlated. So let's just visualize them. I mean, I don't know, but we can just plot something, and then we put the two together to see whether there are some correlations between monthly income and drop level. And we can see that actually a lot of people, I mean, here, the label, sorry, I didn't explain, but the label here, yes, means this guy have left, le left, sorry. And we can see that we can see that most of the guys who have left the company, they are here. They are distributed like low income and uh, comparatively low job level. So this is very useful information, so that we we can sort of confident these two are the important factors that we can maybe use of to do the prediction, right? And after we have maybe identified the initial factors for prediction, uh, we have to generalize, we have to develop the framework where we can you know, uh, develop the model by using the data. And the framework here is, here I have, uh, for example, the, the, the data of employee for the past n months. Or maybe, I mean, this, this N is a variable. It can be anything. I mean, depends on the, 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 the requirement for the real case. And the, the data of uh, the static data and dynamic data will be aggregate, ag aggregated into, I mean, in a, in, a, in a column, in a data set. And these guys will be features for creating the model, all right? And then what we are go going to do is to predict whether this guy will leave the company in the next M plus one month. All right, so the, the plus one means, okay, there, there is the notice period for most of the company, so we have to consider that. And this is the basic framework for prediction of employee attrition. And after we have, I, uh, after we have constructed the framework, we have to you know, decide which feature extraction, uh, which features from the original data are useful to 
do the model prediction. Normally, we have a lot of techniques to extract the features for a for employee data. For example, some simple statistics like max, mean, standard deviation, and also sometimes we know we we are analyzing some pre. Uh, uh, some, some historical behavior of the employees, and we can form the data into a time series, and we can you know, do some trend analysis or time series model to extract the features from the data. And also, you know, just, just now I mentioned that a lot of time we can also use the text information, text the data, and we can apply the text mining techniques to, to deal with this kind of data. And after we have uh, uh, finished the feature extraction, we have to select which features are the most salient ones so that they, they are you know, mostly correlated with the, the, the label we are going to predict, right? I mean, a lot of times, not all of them are useful. So we have to do the feature selection. And uh, after that will be the core part of the whole process, which is model creation. We know that our problem is a uh, supervised classification problem. Basically, it's just to classify whether this employee is going to leave or to stay, right? So it's a binary classification. And uh, for binary classification, we have several choices. Uh, for example, we have logistic regression, and we have support vector machine, or decision tree, or some other algorithms. And all of these are uh, actually very popular machine learning algorithms for do this kind of task. And also, a lot of times, to improve the overall performance of prediction, we can, we can actually create an ensemble of the basic models in order to have a boosted performance, right? So there are several uh, commonly used techniques for ensemble, that is bagging, boosting, and stacking. And all of them, I mean, uh, a very important practice in doing data science is how can you select this, which, which one is the uh, best algorithm? Or how can we do the ensemble to improve the performance? And how can I you know, fine tune the parameters? So these, um, these are really, uh, uh, what should I say, it's more like an art in science because uh, it depends not just on the, the, the algorithm itself, so it also depends on the data characteristics. So a lot of times what we are doing is we, we, we have the selection of the, uh, the algorithms and we just do a grid search and we, we find the optimal one. Or maybe sometimes we also try whether we can put them together to form an ensemble to have a better performance. Okay. And after we have created the model, we have to validate the model, whether the model is uh, whether the model has the, the require, uh, required performance, right? So for classification problem, we, we normally create uh, the, the confusion matrix. And in the, uh, from the confusion matrix, we can get the matrix of uh, such as precision, or recall, or F-score, or if you want, you can calculate the area on the curve. And all of these can be used to you know, analyze whether the model is good or not. And uh, yeah, so just now I've uh, shared with you guys that how we approach a uh, data science problem of predicting employee attrition, right? And now I'm going to present um, uh, our accelerator. And why we call it our accelerator is a lot of times, actually, we, when, we, when we work with our customers, they, um, the very beginning of the project will be uh, can you do a proof of concept for us? Can you just, I mean, with some sample data set, can you just show me, okay, this one is gonna work? It's not like, okay, let's start with the big project and let's use all of my data available onto maybe Spark or some other big data engine to solve the problem. It's not like that. So everything starts from a small, small one. And that is why we have the so-called R accelerator to accelerate the, 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 the proof of concept to accelerate the process of developing a data science uh, solution to help the, either the customer or help a uh, machine learning learner to, you know, to, to understand the business problem, to understand the typical working flow of the data science problem. Okay, so 
the R accelerator is very lightweight. I mean, it's, it's very small and you can easily adopt and you can easily develop by your, uh, own, uh, with your own problem. And also, uh, it, it follows the Microsoft the TDSP format. So it means that you can organize, uh, organize the project uh, following the suggestions, recommendations from TDSP. And also, it's very easy for prototyping, presenting, and documentation. OK. So I, how much time do I have? Five minutes, right? So I will not go to the details of the code here because. Please do. Uh, huh? Please do. That's interesting. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Please do. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you another ten more minutes. That's okay. With you okay, guys. let me try my best. <laughs> because I, I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, your, your guys, but I, okay. Um, this is the. Um, this is the walkthrough of an R accelerator to predict the employee attrition. Um, exactly the same thing was as what I described just now, but it's more like an implementation, right? How we do that with R. I'm not sure whether how many of you know R or have any experience of R. Can you? Okay. So because. Uh, what I'm going to talk is a lot of this kind of code, very technical stuff. So I will just try to, you know, talk. Don't worry, just walk us okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is my session, which means that these are the mm, my working environment and what packages I'm using for the problem. And uh, I I used to that because you know because of the confidential problem I, I, we cannot share the the customer data right so that is why I I use the public data and for the employee attrition data is from IBM and for the text data is from Glassdoor uh, that is the just review comments and you can easily uh, find it on the website and. Uh, so first of all, just now I, 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 I talked about we need to do some preparation for data to make sure that the data is ready for model creation. And basically what we are doing with data preprocessing is, for example, we, 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 how we handle NAs and how we remove some non-variance and how we do some normalization or scaling of data. And also sometimes we need to do some data type conversion as well. So these are the initial steps to you know, just prepare your data for later use. And uh, yeah, so here what I show is Mm, I will make some of the data I, uh, in this data set to be factor. And uh, then another very important thing is because the, the sample data I'm using here is, uh, how to say, it's, the, uh, it's a clean data set. It's not like what we are doing in the real world project because actually when, uh, when we do with customer, the raw data set is, is very messy. You have to do a lot of aggregation, a lot of feature engineering in order to have a data that is ready for use. But here the sample data set is very, looks very nice. And I mean, you have columns and they are very well organized. So we, we don't have to do the feature engineering. We just directly use it. But we still have to do feature selection, right? The problem here is that because the, the, the data is the mixed type data, it's not just numerical, it has also categorical data. So we cannot do just simply do the correlation analysis. We can, another way, another workaround is to create a model and this model can help us to find which are the um, factors. Uh, that we can use for the, the best performance, okay? So these are the, uh, this is the feature selection part. And here you can see that after we create a model, we can have a ranking of the, uh, the variables in the data set. And probably we can, based on some you know, criteria, criteria, we can select the top several variables to create the model. And after that, let's say we, we select several models. We, we just removed the last three, okay? And these are the variables 
we use for model creation. And the next step is probably you know that when we do the model creation, we have to partition the data set into two groups, one, uh, two sets. One is the training set, another is testing set. For the training set, we just use it for training the model, and the testing set is to validate the model. Okay. So firstly, we do this, but one thing that worth mentioning about is the the training set is not balanced. Okay, because if, if the data set is not balanced, it will create a lot of problems for your model training. I will not explain in details, but here a normal tricks to you know to 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 solve the data imbalance problem is we can do either cost sensitive learning, okay, or we can do resampling on the data. And actually the second one is more straightforward. And we can, you know, upsampling the minority class so that we can sort of balance the, the two classes. So that after we, there, there is a very popular technique called SMOTE. And this, this technique is just to, you know, uh, do the resampling and uh, rebalance the data sets so that we can have a, 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 a better data set for training, training the model. Okay, so you can see that after we apply SMOTE on the training set, we can have a sort of balanced data, uh, training set to, to train our model. And then after that, we will do the, the model training part. And uh, because now the, here I'm using the carrot package, and actually we have many other choices, but this is one of the uh, most convenient package we can use for training a model. And these are the training control. And uh, to do some comparison analysis, we use, I mean, here is just an illustration, right? And I, I just use three different algorithms, that is, uh, which are support vector machine and random forest and uh, extreme gradient boosting, which uh, is very popular nowadays. And uh, aside from the, 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 the simple models, the basic models, I also do an uh, ensemble of these three models. And here, one of the ensemble methods I introduced just now is a stacking of the basic models, which means, let's say we have some models M1, M2, and two M, M N maybe. And uh, the, the idea of stacking is we, we can have a meta model. The meta model is at the last uh, final stage of the, 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 the overall model, which means that after the initially the basic model gives some outputs of prediction, the meta model will take the prediction results as inputs and then give the final results of the prediction. So this is the basic idea of uh, uh, stacking ensemble. And a lot of times this is very useful to boosting the performance of overall because you can intuitively think, uh, consider uh, this, this scenario to be something like leverage on the advantages of different algorithms and you know uh, to improve the performance of overall okay so here I am uh, I'm using stacking ensemble based on the previously trained model which are SVM random forest and XG boost and then I use another meta model uh, to you know to create the overall en uh, ensemble and uh, after I have trained the model, I have to use the testing set to validate what are the performance of these models. And uh, as I said before, we can you know, uh, get the confusion matrix of the, the test uh, validation results, and we can calculate the accuracy, recall, and the precision. And also, we, uh, here I also compare the elapsed time. But the funny part is, the stacking actually did not improve the performance of XGBoost boost and random forest too much. So what, what might be the reasons? Actually, if you are doing stacking ensemble, one of the very important things to, to bear in mind is the diversity of the basic models is very important. I mean, if the models, they are, they are all the same, the, the stacking will not improve at all. Okay, so it means your model should be diverse 
And another thing is sometimes the data size or the mm, uh, more gen uh, generically, the data characteristics will also be very important to the performance, uh, performance of stacking ensemble. So here, my data set is not so big, just 1,400 rows. And also the diversity of model, I just have three models. And maybe the XGBoost has already done a lot of things to improve the performance. So there is not too much space for the stacking ensemble to improve. So that is why you can see the performance here is not that good. I mean, the improvement of performance is, is very limited. Okay. Usually how much data would you require? How many rows of data would um, you It really depends. It really depends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But normally it can be maybe millions of rows or whatever. Yeah. So that maybe you can see the, uh, how to say, okay. remarkably right. change of the performance. Yeah. Yeah. But specifically for this, this model evaluation, yeah. uh, what, is, what would be your recommended uh, data size or number of data rows? Uh, um, okay, for what we have been doing with customer, the, the data set can be millions of rows. Millions. Yeah, can be very big. Yeah, can be very big. Or <coughs> if we use the sample data, it's like tens of thousands of rows. And also, you can see the uh, improvement of the models if you use DAC. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually, you want to train. Sorry, go ahead. A quick question: what, what, how do you, what do you interpret accuracy? Is it the mean square error, or is it the R square, or the um, F test? You know. Yeah, accuracy. Actually, you can directly calculate from uh, your confusion matrix. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like mean square error because that is for class of, uh, that is for regression. Yeah. Okay. At, at which point accelerator comes into the because these are all of our comments, right? Our yes. So yeah. Whenever, whenever the, the accelerator comes in. Um, you mean the accelerator, right? Yes. Accelerator is a concept. Okay. This concept is. Um, okay. This uh, what what I'm talking right now is the accelerator. Actually, uh, because I'm doing presentation, but actually the the accelerator is. You can check the GitHub repository. It's, um, uh, it's written in R Markdown. And uh, there will be introduction of the business problem and also a walkthrough of the data science techniques and how we, why we do this and why we do that. And people can easily understand. And the most important part is uh, the, the accelerator can be used to generate other stuff, like pure code and also PDF and HTML so that you can easily present and distribute your idea to your colleagues or collaborators. Yeah, so that, is, that concept is called the accelerator, but not the code I'm showing here. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure I get it. So what is it? Like a guideline to create models? Something like that. It's a how-to guideline, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, uh, you were on the page of the visualization. We did a lot of data visualization using that. We've done the split view about six, seven years uh, back, and we added the predictive prescriptive and the descriptive modeling that gave us all this. How different is this compared to that? You mean this one? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, um, six, seven years back that I used to do both on static as well as on real time data. Uh, you are just talk how, how different is your visualization compared to Tableau, Dundas, and ClickView? Because mm. that gives me more accuracy. Uh, it gives me one by one millionth of an accuracy when I'm visualizing the data. Mm. Okay. Uh, Tableau is a more... Uh, uh, more using Tableau only as one of, the, one of the points as well as data visualization is concerned. Mm. There are many more, you know, yeah, understand. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yes. So Tableau is the commercial software and it's specifically for visualization. So what I want to say is visualization, data visualization is more powerful and more, how to say, uh, more, uh, I mean, compared to, because what, what I have done here is to use uh, ggplot2. And ggplot2 is one of the R packages for data visualization. And uh, what I want to say is, because when we do data science in R, or maybe a lot of other folks they are doing in Python, right? You want to immediately get the results of your, uh, you, you want to immediately visualize your data in your working environment. Instead of going to, let's say you, 
you are you are developing some codes and you want to see okay what is the correlation of the data I just collected, right? And you can do this in R, but if you want to do this in tablet, I'm not sure whether there is any interface between tablet and R, but it will be a little bit tricky, right? No, it's not. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that it gives me much more precision and much more accuracy. As a matter of fact, I don't have to go through with this. I use the predictive modelings, descriptive modelings. My, my, uh, you know. So when I use them and combine them with uh, the tab view, dundas, and click views, as a matter of fact, it gives me much, much more bigger accuracy. Mm. <coughs> so therefore, I was just looking because I'm. I also do a lot on R and Python as well. Okay. So okay. my question is, how different is it, or where exactly are you trying to say that you're different? That's it. I'm actually I'm not to say that uh, this is different from from Tableau or what. I mean, this is just uh, how we do in R and do data visualization. Oh, but definitely, okay. you can also go for okay. Tableau. I, I get you. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so it also depends on the implementation of the algorithms. Um, you know, Tableau may have some algorithms, but um, um, there's not much that beats XGBoost at the moment. Um, so XGBoost is probably one of the most accurate classification algorithms available, probably surpassing much of Tableau. I haven't used Tableau in a few The long new time. one, if you could take a look at it. Yeah. All of the vendors are, are, are um, competing yeah. there to, to improve them a little bit by a little bit. You're getting marginal improvements, pretty marginal improvements, and often the variation of the performance of the model <coughs> is, is um, wipes out the actual differences that you get between the different algorithms and the different packages. So, you know, there's. Because I nearly got an IFR with you correctly, the ideal final result uh, matching me at about 99 or 98%. So, and what's the variation of the uh, performance values there, I, I would ask, and, and it all depends on the data. Yes. But uh, we better let it take. Sure, sure. Maybe he's hungry, so when we go yes. on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, sorry, but, but I, I just have uh, five minutes to talk. So let me finish first. And after that, maybe we can have a discussion. OK. So next thing I would like to share with you guys is after we uh, just now I show how to deal with the some you know uh, employee data, HR data. But now another important thing is how we can analyze the text data to you know to to get a sense of the sentiment of the employee so as to predict whether they are going to leave. So here I also collect the data from Glassdoor, and you can see these are the review comments of these guys on their company. And what we are doing with text mining for sentiment analysis. Basically, we we uh, we also follow the, the the steps here. We we first lead to some initial transformation. Uh, what what I mean by initial transformation transformation is that we remove the unnecessary elements such as stop words and numbers and other stuff which carry no useful information in the text. And then after that. Because a lot of times, you know, the large companies, they are MNC and they have employees in different countries, different locations, using different kind of languages. So a very important thing is how we can align the, uh, the, the text in different languages into one single language, maybe English or maybe some other languages, so that we can reduce the number of terms, right? So if I say something like ni hao in Chinese, it means the same thing um, like hello in English, right? So uh, after we do the initial transformation, we can create a bag of words model to you know count uh, either the term frequency of the documents or maybe the term frequency inverse document frequency. I mean it's a little bit twisted, but yeah, these are something that we can convert the text data into the numerical data because the numerical data will be something that is friendly to the machine learning algorithms, right? So after we have introduced this, let me show you how we can do that with the, this package is uh, called the TM package and also a R package, R package with, which is very, very popular for text mining. And you can see that basically what I've, what, what I've done is just to follow the steps introduced just now to do some transformation and uh, convert the original text into term matrix, okay? 
And then after that, you will see something like this, OK? Uh, the, the docs index here, actually each one of the, the docs represent an employee. And the terms here, you can see the company and Google. Yeah, this is the company name and the grade and people smart work. So you can see that these are the term frequency of the employees. And we can use this one as the data set or feature set for prediction. And then after that, it will be very similar to what we have been doing with other kinds of data, which is you know, put the labels of the uh, data into the term frequency data set, and then partition the data into training set, testing set, and create a model. Here I just use SVM, and then do some prediction and validation, and here are the results. So this part will be pretty much the same, but the, the different part is, uh, when, we, when we are dealing with the unstructured data like text, we have to do some initial feature engineering, which is specific to this kind of data. And for text, we have to do uh, initial transformation and then do uh, conversion from text to vectors and then do you know, uh, model creation. So these are the general workflow of uh, doing text mining in, in data science projects. So here, here is the conclusion. And in today's talk, I have shared with you guys how we do a data science projects for real world problem. And basically what I want to emphasize is feature engineering actually is very, very, very important and it consumes majority of the time of the project. And uh, another thing is uh, I've shared some, uh, just some techniques that are commonly used for doing model creation and model validation, and also how we can do sentiment analysis on text data so as to predict whether the employee you know, has have some negative opinions on the company. Okay, and uh, all of the resources will be available on GitHub. So here is the URL, and including the presentation. Actually, the presentation is generated from our code as well, so you can you know, run by yourself. These are the references for the talk, and uh, this is my contact. If you have any question, I mean, after the talk, maybe you can approach me and we can have discussions as well. Okay, all right. All right, round of applause for uh, <laughs> the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.